Welcome to the podcast series for the Journal of Neurophysiology. I'm Bill Yates, the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal, and today I'm talking with David, Phil, and Jerry about thermal regulation and thermal sensitivity, including his recently published paper, Characteristics of the Local Cutaneous Sensory Thermal Neutral Zone. David, before we begin, how about telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm an assistant professor within the Environmental Ergonomics Research Centre at Loughborough University in the UK. Um, my research background is at the interface between um, human environmental physiology and uh, sensory neuroscience. And specifically, I'm interested in investigating how body temperature is regulated and how the nervous system process sensory information related to skin temperature and wetness in both health and uh, neurological diseases, such as uh, multiple sclerosis, for example. David, you published five papers in the Journal of Neurophysiology in the past three years about the perception of wetness and more recently about temperature sensation. Can you tell us how you became interested in these topics? My interest in wetness and thermal sensitivity in humans was actually ignited by studying uh, human temperature regulation. I was very fascinated to realize that um, despite humans need to carefully regulate their body temperature within a very narrow range to ensure survival, uh, you know, we, we're kind of a fragile uh, homeothermic mammal. Uh, we, we've, we've still managed to uh, populate almost any harsh environment on this planet, and, and we move made it to the moon. Um, this is quite unique across the animal kingdom and, uh, and it can only be explained by a very well developed uh, ability to behaviorally uh, thermoregulate. So we're very good at sensing the properties of our surrounding environment such as temperature and humidity and we adjust our thermal behavior accordingly. Uh, so the question that really hooked me up on this area uh, are quite simply how can we do that? How can we sense temperature and humidity? How does the brain process the sensory information to make us so good at sensing, uh, you know, that cold breeze in a, in a summer afternoon uh, or uh, that tiny drop of rain on our face? So I guess these fundamental questions uh, really spark my interest uh, in the area of uh, temperature sensitivity and wetness perception. Your latest paper, Characteristics of the Local Cutaneous Sensory Thermal Neutral Zone, focuses on how we perceive skin temperature as hot or cold. How does the study add to the literature on thermal sensitivity? Well, um, with the study, we were uh, very much interested in a little understood feature of human thermal sensitivity, the so-called uh, sensory thermal neutral zone. Uh, we've known for a long time that when our skin is exposed to temperatures around 30 to 34 uh, degrees Celsius, which would be 86 to 93 uh, Fahrenheit, we don't really experience neither a cold nor a warm sensation. We are in what we call a sensory neutral state. So this is observed regularly in uh, thermoregulatory and thermal sensitivity kind of research. And this concept is so widely accepted uh, that any textbooks on thermal physiology would say that the range 30 to 34 degrees Celsius skin temperature is the only one that corresponds to thermal neutrality. Uh, however, the characteristics of, uh, of the local cutaneous sensory neutral zone have never been analyzed directly. So we therefore decided to ask the question and test whether this uh, sensory neutral zone occurs only within this uh, 30 to 34 degrees Celsius skin temperature range, uh, or whether this could actually shift outside at lower or higher temperatures uh, higher skin temperatures. So it turns out that sensory thermal neutrality uh, can actually be achieved outside this, uh, this skin temperature range that we've been told about. So our findings indicate that the central integration of temperature, uh, of temperature inputs from peripheral thermal receptors uh, could actually be more complex than we previously thought. David, can you tell us a little bit about the exact experiments you conducted and what the results were? Sure. Um, to characterize the properties of the sensory thermal neutral zone, we developed another uh, psychophysical procedure that we devised from uh, vision neuroscience to assess dichromatic vision. And we used it to test whether neutrality would shift across the temperature continuum, uh, depending on, a, on, a, on an adaptation to a preceding thermal state. 
So in practice, what we did, we recruited 10 healthy participants uh, who took part to our experiments, and we used a small thermal probe that we applied to the skin of the palm of the hand, as well as the forearm, and we delivered seven different warm and cold stimuli, starting from three different uh, baseline skin temperatures. Uh, and these skin temperatures uh, were either 26, 31, or 36 degrees Celsius. And uh, whenever we would deliver a stimulus to the skin, the stimulus would either be one, two, or three degrees Celsius above or below these initial skin temperatures. Uh, all the participants had to do, uh, they would be prompted with a two alternative force of choice, and they had to report whether the stimulus experience was either warm or cold. Um, with this uh, uh, choice, two force choice paradigm, we, we used a binary scoring system. So whenever there would be a cold response, this would be considered as a zero, and a warm response would be a one. Um, each of the stimuli would be delivered 15 times, and we totaled 115 responses. And as a result, we were able to fit psychometric curves to this data, and we were able to identify that temperature that would be perceived 50% of the times as warm and 50% of the times as cold. Um, and we consider that one as our uh, neutral temperature, uh, the temperature for which the participants wouldn't be able to distinguish between a clear warm or cold sensation. Uh, following up on that, we consider the 25th and 75th percentiles on our psychometric curves as the boundaries of the thermoneutral zones, and we were able to quantify the width of the thermoneutral zone for each one of the participants. Uh, by repeating this is a different starting skin temperature, um, we were able to define that the width of the sensory thermoneutral zone is quite small. It ranges between 1 and 1.3 degrees Celsius. And we also demonstrated that the sensory thermoneutral zone could be achieved from starting skin temperatures that were well above or below the traditional 30 to 34 degrees Celsius uh, skin temperature range. And, and finally, we found very interesting to realize that the width of the sensory thermoneutral zone was actually different depending on whether we were testing the uh, palm of the hand or the forearm, suggesting that there might be regional differences in uh, sensory thermoneutrality across the body. So what are your future plans? What studies are next in the pipeline for your lab? Um, we're currently exploring the translational value of, uh, of our work on skin uh, thermal sensitivity and, and skin wetness in the context of neurological diseases such as uh, uh, multiple sclerosis as well as Parkinson's disease. Um, these conditions are often associated with uh, sensory abnormalities and these occur, actually occur early in the, in, in the disease. Um, however, they've received very little attention, so we believe that if we uh, increase our understanding of these uh, physiological mechanisms in these conditions, we could actually improve uh, the early detection as well as the assessment of the progression of these diseases. So what we're currently doing, we've conducted a series of experiments with some collaborators at the University of Sydney in Australia as well as the, uh, the uh, Southern Methodist University in Texas, involving individuals with multiple sclerosis. Um, our preliminary results show that individuals with multiple sclerosis that experience heat sensitivity manifest a reduction in their cold but not warm skin temperature sensitivity as a result of increases in, uh, in, uh, in internal body temperature. So as MS is a demyelinating disorder, and as the human afferent pathway for cold sensitivity is a myelinated one, we believe that this preliminary result could actually give us some more insights on the, uh, on the impact of MS on the afferent somatosensory function in, uh, in these individuals. In your opinion, what are the remaining uh, major questions to be answered in the fields of thermoregulation and thermal sensitivity? Well, this is, this is quite a tricky question. Uh, and, and in my personal view, there are three main fundamental questions that I can see being still outstanding in our field. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, basic human uh, temperature regulation. Uh, we know that we regulate our internal temperature within an hour range, which is usually around the 36 to 37 degrees Celsius uh, absolute temperature, which would be 96.8 to 98.6 in Fahrenheit. Uh, however, we still don't know why we have evolved to regulate our body temperature around uh, such values. 
the second question has to do with, uh, with thermal receptors, with our temperature sensitive receptors uh, across the body. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the past few years on the molecular uh, candidates that, that allow sensory receptor to, to transduce temperature, the, the so-called thermosensitive TRP channels. Um, and a lot of work has been done on animal models. So whether we still know very little on how thermal receptors work in humans, because there's been very little work on in vivo recordings from uh, thermal receptors in, uh, um, in humans. And, and on top of that, we know that thermal sensitivity changes quite uh, widely across the body. And, uh, and, we still, uh, and we're still wondering whether that has to do with the density of thermal receptors or with some uh, uh, central integration processes. Um, and, the, and the final major question that I feel quite, quite close about uh, due to my interest in skin wetness perception has actually to do with the neural mechanisms underlying the way we sense wetness on the skin. Uh, we've only recently uh, started to understand how humans can, uh, can sense wetness and humidity um, and, and considering that this one is a particularly uh, common sensory experience. Uh, this is this is quite surprising. Uh, well, we still know very very little on on how the peripheral inputs that are involved with wetness sensors uh, are centrally processed uh, by the by the central nervous system. Um, and increasing the knowledge in the area could actually be uh, interesting because there is currently very large interest on how these mechanisms take place in other animal species such as um, um, insects, uh, fruit flies, for example. Um, and we've long assumed that humans are not provided with a specific receptors for humidity, hygro receptors. So whether, uh, it's important to say that we've never formally undertaken a search for a human hygro receptor. So I think in general, this, this could actually be some, uh, some major outstanding questions in our field that would require uh, more, more research. David, thanks for speaking with us today and for all your wonderful contributions to the Journal of Neurophysiology. Bill, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today and to engage so closely with the Journal of Neurophysiology. You've been listening to a Journal of Neurophysiology podcast. Read our journal online at jn.org.